Hi there. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about The Diet by Caroline Duffy. This is one of my favourite poems in the collection of feminine gospels. And it's really designed for A-level students who want to know uh, what the poem might be referring to and looking at it in a little bit more depth than uh, we normally do uh, in the second part of the poem. Okay, so here we have Caroline Duffy's The Diet, and I'm just going to point out to you certain conventions that we tend to see with Caroline Duffy poetry, certainly in the Feminine Gospels. If you look to the top right here, I've listed them. Asyndetic listing, where we get a list without connectives, it's just a list, and we see that right here. Salt, dairy, fat, protein, starch or alcohol. That's asyndetic listing and we see it throughout the poem. We get internal rhyme, okay? Uh, not the traditional end rhyming uh, at the ends of lines, but actually um, rhyme that occurs within the actual poem. So you might get um, uh, stone and bone, for instance, okay? Um, And also uh, we will get um, the metamorphosis occurring in her poems where there's a change that occurs. Now obviously there's a change occurring in stanza one where she is actually uh, losing weight but she actually changes uh, towards the end of the third stanza into the size of a thimble and gets blown away by the wind. So metamorphosis also occurs. An accessible start is often seen in a Caroline Duffy poem. I, I, she lures you in with something that you completely understand, with a, a, a kind of a cliched phrase in some ways. The diet worked like a dream, okay? Like a dream, a simile, but it's also relatively cliched. We've heard that phrase many a time, and it's very important that we have heard that many a time because that's the point Caroline Duffy's making. We keep going on diets. Um, demotic language, uh, really, you know, casual use, uh, formal words made into casual everyday use in some ways. Language that is uh, colloquial or um, uh, things said in a casual fashion, if you like, okay? So demotic language is also a feature of a work. Those are the five major conventions that you spot in a lot of Caroline Duffy's poetry. Okay, let's go through it very quickly. Um, the diet, the diet worked like a dream, no sugar, salt, dairy, fat, protein, starch, or alcohol. So the asyndetic listing, by the end of week one, she was half a stone, shy of 10. Notice that enjambment right there, okay? She was half a stone. It's almost suggesting that she's becoming, you know, ridiculously thin already. But it's actually half a stone, shy of 10, and shrinking. Right, it's very accessible in, in terms of a start because who hasn't gone on a diet? Well, many, uh, you know, not many people haven't thought about dieting. And so we're going, oh, shy of 10. Right, for a woman, you know, quite nice. Uh, you know, what's considered nice, shrinking, skipping breakfast. Um, you'll notice here that we get, suddenly, it's like, Skipping breakfast, lunch, dinner, thinner, uh, internal rhyme again. Uh, a fortnight in, she was eight stone. By the end of the month, she was skin and bone. All right, hang on. We've got a kind of metamorphosis occurring here, but it worked well, the diet, but hang on, skin and bone, warning signs are beginning to come in. But look at the rhythm of this all. It's, it's jauntily carrying along as if we're caught up in this wonderfully effective diet and it's all good, you know. Um, a fortnight in, she was eight stone, by the end of the month she was skin and bone. Uh, and, and it rhymes as if that's what she wants. That's what she wants. Uh, it's interesting it's a she, um, because it's obviously feminine gospels, we're looking at issues that are primarily uh, usually female issues. But it's obviously important to say here as well that the diet principally is considered something that women do, but obviously it's something that men do as well, and they also suffer from eating disorders. Um, so, so these poems apply to a wider audience than what we might initially think. So we move on to the second stanza, and then we get this, uh, we get a kind of sibilance here. She starved on, stayed in, stared in. What an interesting um, sort of connection there. Starved on, stayed in, stared in, the mirror. On Jean once again there, but it's this S sounding, okay, as if it's unstoppable. 
All right, starved on stayed instead in the mirror, svelte, slimmer. So we've got the S sounding again. This is obviously sibilance, okay, along with obviously alliteration going on here, okay. Um, it all increases the sense of unstoppable. The last apple aged in the fruit bowl, right? Well, that's obviously a reference to Adam and Eve, um, you know, the temptation of the apple. Well, this person resists the temptation. Well done. <laughs> they're, they're an amazingly effective dieter, you might think, but well done is really an ironic term because it's all going a little bit out of control. The skimmed milk, obviously it was skimmed milk, and we've got this focus on the S sound still. The skimmed milk soured in the fridge, unsupped. Her skeleton preened under its tight flesh dress. Suddenly, it's all going a little bit dangerous, isn't it? Her skeleton. Now, what we've got here, I would suggest to you, from a kind of medical aspect, is body dysmorphia. The person is convinced they are not the right weight. No matter how thin they get, they look in the mirror and they see someone who is larger than they want to be, okay? So, uh, an element of body dysmorphia, skeleton under its tight flesh dress, you know, it's almost making it sound like it's still attractive, isn't it? Um, she was all eyes. Well, you'll know this from anorexia sufferers that the eyes begin to dominate the face. All cheekbones had guns for hips. Okay, that's an interesting metaphor, isn't it? Because guns for hips means that her hips are sticking out. It also means there's an element of danger here. Not a stitch in the wardrobe fitted. Okay, so there's a real focus on the S sound in the second stanza, along with the internal rhyme, gives us this sense of unstoppability. Like this is continuing. And, and there's no stopping it. Now, in the third stanza, what passed her lips, the rhetorical question, air, water. She was anorexia's true daughter, right? Internal rhyme again. And it's a beautifully um, tragic way of describing the condition, you know, because of her amazing self-control, ability to resist temptation, she is becoming anorexic. This is terrible but it continues a slip of a girl a shadow dwindling away right the metamorphosis is occurring here in the third stanza one day the width of a stick she started to grow smaller right this happens in a lot of Callan Duffy's poems child sized doll sized the height of a thimble she sat at her open window and the window blew her away okay so metaphorically she's become nothing or become tiny a speck of dust. And this is the metamorphosis that occurs in Caroline Duffy poems. The woman who shops, she becomes an actual shop. You know, so um, it's not surprising to see this convention. So what happens to her now? We have to think about it metaphorically. What does this mean? Seed small. She was out and about looking for home. An empty beer bottle rolled in the gutter. So having achieved this microscopic weight, she is now just living in the gutter. Quite often we think that we're going to be more confident, life's going to be better, we're going to get the man or woman that we want if we're thinner. But in fact, all we are is just a bit thinner. So this person is in the gutter, curiously enough, ironically enough. She crawled in, got drunk on the dregs. So there's an element of celebration here, perhaps. Started to sing, down out, nobody's love. Okay. So she hasn't achieved what she thought she'd get. All she's got is isolation and loneliness. Tiny others joined in. They raved all night. She woke alone. Oh, she was expecting to perhaps have a better life. But in fact, she's in the gutter. She's head splitting, mouth dry, hungry and cold and made for the light. So something's gone wrong here. Okay. And... The diet hasn't achieved the effect it was expected. It's a bit like the poem Tall, where she goes off to a bar to get drunk and actually discovers that she's just isolated and alone. She found she could fly on the wind. Okay, well that sounds positive. Could breathe if it rained underwater. Okay, so she's almost becoming superhuman. That night she went to a hotel bar that she knew and floated into the barman's eye. All right, so floating into the barman's eye suggests that she uh, has, has attracted his eye. Okay, maybe she's found herself um, attractive to him. 
She slept for hours, left at dawn in a blink, in a wink, drifted away on a breeze. So whether she slept with him or not, she drifts away again. She is uh, in her own world now, focused, absolutely obsessed perhaps by being thin. Minute, she could suit herself from here on in, go where she pleased. All right, so there's a sense of, well, now she's achieved that choice. Now she's achieved her aim. So now she can do what she wants. She's got confidence. But look at the result. She stayed near people, lay in the tent of a nostril like a germ, dwelled in the caves of an ear. She lived in a tear, swam clear, moved south to a mouth, kipped in the chap of a lip. What's going on? Why is she in these positions? What, as a microscopic person, why would she be in the tent of a nostril? Or in the caves of an ear? Or living in a tear? Perhaps she's so small that she's in these areas. She's inhabiting these areas. Like she's actually um, in, the, in, the, in the nose, the nostril, where we smell food. The urge to eat is when we're tearful or emotionally upset. The mouth, perhaps, is where we eat, obviously. Kipped in the chap of a lip is where we taste. I'm not so sure about caves of an ear, perhaps the sound of food being cooked, I don't know. But maybe she's becoming that guilty conscience. Maybe, she said she loved flesh and blood, uh, blood wallowed in mud under fingernails, dosed in a fold of fat on a waist. Think about that, okay? If you look down and you see a fold of fat, the sense of needing to go on a diet is there. The taste of food, but you don't. You deny yourself because otherwise you, you're worried about getting fat. Is this a person now that lives in our guilty conscience? She's become part of our guilty conscience. That person, the successful dieter, the person who could be so thin. So now she's living in our guilty consciences, perhaps. Okay? Interesting because we then go, when she squatted on the tip of her tongue, she was gulped, swallowed, sent down the hatch in a river of wine, bottoms up, cheers. Okay, notice the bottoms up and cheers. This is demotic language. It's the language of, you know, casual interchange. Fetched up in her stomach just before lunch, she crouched in the lining, hearing the avalanche of munch of food. Then it was carrots, peas, courgettes, potatoes, gravy and meat. Then it was sweet, then it was Stilton, Roquefort, Wieslacker, Kaze, Gex, it was smoked salmon with scrambled eggs, hot boiled ham, plum flan, frog's legs. Right, obviously the internal rhyme and asyndetic listing is being used to great effect here in this binge. What we've got is the bulimic now, the binger. There's been so much uh, temptation that's been um, avoided that this person is now eating uh, gorging themselves. But the dieter is within the person, isn't she? she? The dieter is not the person who's eating all this. This is her being caught up in this upload of food. So she, as it says here at the end there, she knew where she was all right, clambered into, onto the greasy breast of a goose, open wide, then chomped and chewed and gorged inside the fat woman now trying to get out. So what's happened? It does appear that she's become microscopic, become part of our guilty conscience, and ends up going into the stomach of a fat woman who's gorging. Almost a reaction to all the dieting. So the irony is at the end of it all, she ends up in the stomach of a fat woman. She becomes, she is metamorphosed uh, into a speck a speck that becomes our guilty conscience, and that guilty conscience uh, causes us to perhaps react and to binge after not being able to diet any further. So, just to recap, we've got ourselves a person who successfully diets, but the metamorphosis means she uh, becomes a speck. That can happen in a Carol Ann Duffy poem. She becomes a speck. She becomes almost so small that she becomes part of our conscience. Whenever we have the urge to eat, we think of her. We think, ah, oh, but this would stop me being thinner. And then eventually she disappears, gets caught up on the lip of someone and disappears into the stomach with the binge eating. Ironically, she ends up in the, in the stomach of a fat woman. Now, metaphorically, ending up in the fat woman 
might be uh, becoming part of the fat woman's conscience. Okay, so that it's she becomes part of the mindset of the fat woman, that guilty conscience of I've got to be thinner, and we're in this vicious cycle of dieting, binging, dieting, binging. Okay, which is obviously bulimia. Um, do note the asyndetic listing, the internal rhyme, the demotic language, the metamorphosis, the accessible start. All these things are occurring in this poem to great effect. But I think it's a real comment on dieting overall. Okay, well, that concludes the diet. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it uh, answered a few questions for you. And like I say, most students tend to talk about the start of the poem, but then they seem to get lost in the second part. And I hope that gives you some kind of insight as to what might be going on. But most importantly of all, uh, as to the conventions of Carol Ann Duffy and how they're applied in the poem. So I hope that's been of use. Thanks a lot.